What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over command lists part 3, or advanced command list part 3 I should say. And so today is the day where we finally do what I've been envisioning this whole time, where we, we wrap it up to get to that point. Not saying we won't do more with it in the future, but this is really the, the point I was trying to reach, the goal I was trying to achieve. So when we come in here, I'm going to skip my stage intros and character entrances, and let's pause the game and go to our command list. So I now have my command list here, and in the last episode, we were able to navigate through it. In this episode, we're going to be able to navigate through it, and the information, the description of the attack, and the video playing are going to change while we are moving through it. So as opposed to just displaying the default data that we had or a specific uh, moves data here, it's going to update when we move. So here we're on light attack. If I go to medium attack, you see it changes as well. The video changes and everything. It loads in just like this. Okay, and you can see the description changes, like I said. So perform a quick elbow attack, perform a launching uppercut. Now, I don't have anything for these other moves because it would take a while for me to record them and because I don't necessarily have uh, the finalized versions of a lot of these that I'm going to have for the template. All <laughs> this is just... Just random stuff that I put in here, random attacks, moves, hitbox data, stuff like that for the time being so we can test the mechanics and get them working. But I did use these two examples so you can you can see what they look like. But you can add as many as you want. You could add uh, video and description for every single move in your command list and it will work the same as this episode. On top of that, we're going to be doing another amazing change today, which is going to clean up a lot of the... Uh, the, the duplicate data that we had. So we had this this command list in the mutant BP. And all of their commands were in here. Now this is fine. However, since we do have this new data table here, if I go to here we go mutant command data. And this has this is how we're filling out our command list. And it's got a bunch of information in here, we can add more even. But since this has everything that we need to make the commands on the character, we should actually only have to update one spot. We don't want to have to update inside the mutant BP and then inside this data table as well. So instead, we're going to just use this data table today. I'm going to transfer everything over. So we're only going to copy over the important data from the data table to the mutants command list. But then we don't have to duplicate it. We don't have to have it in two spots. So we're going to clean up a lot today. All right, but with that said, we are ready to get started. But before we do, if you'd like to get caught up in the series, I believe we're on episode 148 of the fighting game tutorial series. If you'd like to get caught up, I will link you to this playlist right here in the top right corner of your screen. That will show you every episode to date. So every episode on how we got to this point, so you can get caught up and, and check out all the progress since the start. We still have a long way to go, but I'm proud of how far we've come so far. Alternatively, if you don't care about that, I will link you to this episode right here, which is the first episode where we covered the command list, because of course we're going to be building on the other topics that we discussed in the previous episodes for the command list. So if you're just worried about the command list, you can still check those episodes out to get caught up here without watching the rest of the series. All right, now we're ready to get started. To begin today, we are going to need to go to our command list widget, of course. So this is our overall widget, right? We have the command list, and then we have these command list elements. So the command list is the actual screen with the data being displayed, and the command list elements are the populated uh, elements for each command in our data table. We set that up, right? So you see them all spawning there. Well, we need to have both the command list and the command list element open today. So let's go to our command list element to start, actually, because it'd be easier to start from there. So we have nothing in the event graph because, again, this is just populated with the commands from the character. It's actually populated in the command list because in the event construct, we spawn them for every command that we find in this data table. And then we fill out the data and, and display it on this widget, right? However... These elements can have data associated with them. Right now, they already have their name. They have this box for the input types. And, of course, this image as well. 
But we can also add other things, like we can add the description that would be associated with it or the file path to the video that would be associated with this command without actually displaying it on this widget. Just to hold that data, that way the command list itself can use that for this video and this text block. All right, so that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to go into our graph and we're going to add two new variables. I added one called description which is a text variable and one called file path, which is a file path structure. So if you click plus variable, like I said, you can make a new one. I'll show you what each of these are. So if I'm going for the description variable, I'm actually using a text variable, not a string. You could use string. It doesn't really matter. The reason I'm using text is because text boxes use text. So it makes it easy. We don't have to convert anything. We can just literally set the text to this value and it works right off the bat. The other one is the file path. So if you make a new variable, you can search for file path and you want the file path structure here. As it says, it is a structure for file paths that are displayed in the editor with a picker UI. All right. And the reason we want that file path and that description is because in the last episode, when we had the mutant command data data table here, we have the description here, which is a text property and the video path, which is a file path property. And just to come full circle, these come from the structure, the F command detail structure, where we have the text and the file path here. That's what the data table is pulling from. It's pulling from the structure. So long story short, we need to add two variables here that can hold this data for each command because we want the commands. Remember, when we're moving down the commands, it should display the right data. So even if it's not on this button right here, this single command list element can hold the data for the file path of the video to display and the description. Now I also made two very simple functions. These are just setters. So these are mutators, if you're familiar with that. And literally, they just take a value and set the variable on here. Now you, you don't have to do this. But this is kind of a more professional way than just grabbing the variable from a different class and setting it. So if you want to follow this method, it's super easy. Make two new functions in the command list element widget. We already had set command name, so you don't have to do anything with this, but it's basically the same process. We're going to make one for set description and set file path. Now set description, once you make it, compile and save. And we can add an input parameter of text, and we're going to call it description. So the description coming in is going to be set to the description variable in here. And this will make more sense why we're doing it this way when we get into the command list changes. We also are going to want to set file path. So if you make a set file path, compile, save, then you can have an input parameter of your file path yet again. And the, the file path is going to set the file path variable here. So literally for both of these functions, go into your functions, drag the variable on the screen that relates to it, set it and just set it to the parameter. Like in this case, this is file path. So you literally set file path and drag it in. It is that simple. So I have two very simple functions here and nothing in the event graph. All right, now let's go to the command list and check out what's changed in there. So let's go to the graph. And I'm going to show you everything. But one thing at the start, we were opening this source so that a video was playing in the previous episode because we had not done any logic to change that video. So we just wanted one video playing. You can now remove this open source that we had at the start. We are going to, of course, add it later, but we don't need it right here because having it here isn't really helpful because if we do that, then we're just playing a default value when we come into this widget. And that might work fine every time you have one character, right? The mutant always is going to start on this video, so that works fine. But when you have different characters using the same widget, they don't want to start on the same video, most likely. So it would be counterproductive to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and just delete that flat out. I just left it there so that you could see that I had it. I'll move everything over to clean it up. But yeah, I went ahead and just got rid of that. Now, the rest of this is the same. So quick refresher, we go through our mutant command data data table, grab all the rows and set that to be the max number of selections. So we know how many we can navigate through. Then we loop through all of the rows, get the data from each row and spawn a command list element widget. This guy right here for each of them so that for every command in that data table, we have one of those widgets on the screen. 
And then we were doing things like filling out all the icons, the, the input icons on how to perform that command. When this was completed, we took the name to set the command name. We called that function on command list element. And we added it to the vertical box. That way it was visible. Now we have two more nodes that we're doing here, and it's going to be our new functions. We want to set the description and we want to set the file path. You could do both of these before adding the child to the vertical box if you'd like, although it won't matter because, like I said, the description and the, the file path are not used within this widget. This is just storing the data. The command list is the one using it. So it doesn't matter if you add this to uh, add this child to the vertical box before setting these or after it. All right, so to do this is really simple. We just have to make sure we're grabbing the right thing to set it on. So you already have an example of set command name, but the widget that we're creating has a return value, and this is our command list element. So you can just call the functions right off here. Set description. See, so you also have the set description, which will do the same thing. Like I said, this is just a fancier way or a more professional way of handling it. That's why I made those functions, because I'm using setters and mutators that's what they're called when you when you set a value through a function as opposed to just setting the variable directly but i've set description and then i have set file path so if you grab the functions on both of those you have both of these guys and they'll have the target here plugged in to the command list element i just have some reroute nodes but it's literally the same thing now we have to pass a description and a file path and luckily, those both come from our F command details because that's what we set it up to do. This data table has this information. It has a description for the light, the medium, and technically I have one for the last element as well, but you can have it, you should have it for every single command in here. And then for the file path, I showed an example for the first one on how to do it, but really I just did the same thing for the second one as well. So I, I have a file path here and I just click the ellipsis to be able to access my directory and I selected the file that I want. I brought in a new video here that does exactly as you'd expect. So if I open this separately, you can see this is the video. Okay, so no, no trickery going on here. So long story short, just make sure you set your description, your video path for the moves that you want to test or if you want, go through all your commands now and set them. Then we can go back to our command list and you'll see that you have your description, your video path here. So you can literally just drag them into the set description function and the video path can go into the set file path function. Before we have this set text here, this is how we were setting the description. Like the open source that I removed earlier in the episode, this was only temporary. This was just so we could have a description there. It's no longer needed. So if you still have this command description text, setting the text, we can get rid of that variable as it is now, the text is now going to be dictated by the command list element that we're on and the description it has. So that's what it should look like now. And that is event construct. And we're not actually done yet. We have another thing we have to update in event construct as well. And it is this completed loop. So we have a for loop inside that loops through all the input types, right? Every input type in the command. That was a for loop. And when that was completed, that's when we added this data. However, we also have the for loop at the very start that goes through every single row in the data table. Now, when this loop completes, we were doing some other logic and we were doing something called determine selection, which I'm not going to go over all this because we covered it in the last episode. But basically, we figured out which selection we were on and then move the scroll box to that value. That way, as we navigate the menu, uh, we can move up and down and be on the correct command that the player would be on. Then I had another function called set title, which just took in a character class and it sets the value for the title. So if we can swap between say mutant and mannequin and Vanguard, it's gonna say the name of the character here. Simple enough, right? But I'm doing two new functions now. So I have an update description and an update video. So we need to make these functions because of course we don't have them. So go ahead and add two new functions in here. Update description, update video. Neither of them take any parameters.
And so this is how we're going to get the description and the video initially, right? Because this is still on event construct when this loop is done. Because we still want to load the video and the description automatically. We just don't want to do it arbitrarily. We want to do it based off the values that are actually present and, and default in this menu. So let's go into update description and I'll show you what I got. So update description and, and really both of these are going to be pretty similar. So what we have to do is we have to figure out what element we're on, get the data from it, and then determine the appropriate description or video path based on that. Once again, the command list element is holding the description and the video path right now. So that's really what we're trying to access. We have this command elements VB, which is potentially a little bit confusing, but really what it is, is it's a vertical box uh, with this scroll box here. And so everything that gets at all the, all the command list elements that get added in here are in that vertical box. We use it in event construct right here. Okay, so we're adding all of the children to it or all the commands to it. All right, so let's go back in here. So this already has all the commands. So if we get all children, surely we'll be able to find the proper command. And there's an even easier way to do it. With our current system, we have something called current index because we have to know which one we are moving on, which one the, the player is currently viewing or, or hovering on. So we need to know what video to play, what description to get, all that. We already set up current index. So we know that every single command is added to this box so we can get all children and actually get the current index as well. And if we do this, we will have the command list element that has the description and the video path we need. This is because the command list elements are added in the same order that they are displayed. And so the current index the user is on will be the index that we want to grab that data from. Okay, so it's pretty simple actually. But if we grab our vertical box here and we get all children, You can drag off of this and type get, and you'll get a copy. Doesn't matter if it's a copy or not, because we're not changing anything about it. We want to get current index here as the result. So this is the index we're grabbing. Now, this is going to return a regular widget. We need to make sure that we're casting it to the command list element. Technically, if there are other children in there, then you could get messed up, and you wouldn't have a command list element. However, we're only ever going to be adding those types of children to this vertical box because that's the point of it. However, we still have to cast because if we don't cast, we won't be able to grab the variables we want. So we have to make sure we cast it to a command list element. All right, and then we drag off of this and we get the variable we need. In this case, we're updating the description, so we need to get the description. Lastly, we need to set the text of our description box. That is our command description text. So I need to grab my command description text, get it, drag off of that, and call set text with text in parentheses. And then you want to drag the description into the text. So we're setting the text on the widget to the text that the command has. And make sure you call that right here on the completed of this for loop. Don't forget to call it after you make that function. Now, we also need update video. So if you added that function already, great. If you didn't, make a new one. Call it update video or whatever you want, really. But something so you know that you're updating the actual video that's playing. And we can go into that function. And we're basically going to do the same thing. We just have to, of course, grab a different value. It's not text anymore. We're going to be grabbing the file path. So I take my command list elements, get all my children, get a copy, use the current index, and cast it to the command list element, just like we did in the other function. At this point, we want to drag off the command list element. Instead of description, we want to get the file path. Now, the file path as it, as is, it's not a string, it's not text, it's, it's its own structure. So you can't just pass this in and say, yep, use this as the file path but you can simply break it and grab the string file path from it. Now, the demo media player, this is the command demo. That's why I called it demo. It's this right here. The media player is what controls what's displaying in this box. Because the media player is going to play a video and we're rendering it to this widget. 
All right, so the demo media player is what I removed earlier when we had demo media player open source. But instead, we don't want to open a source because we don't want to pass it a specific uh, video or, or, or media player or media file, I mean. But we want to instead pass it a file path. So there's a similar function if we grab our demo media player and get it. There's a similar function called open file. Okay, so instead of open source, we want open file right here. And when you do this, you'll be able to pass in a file path and it will open it as long as it is able to. Well, it will be able to as long as the path is correct. So we can pass the file path to it and we will be good to go. All right. So this is open. This is update video right here. Quick note on these videos. They have an absolute path instead of a relative path. Or really, they, they do have a relative path, but it's just really, really far out of where we want it to be. You can move this and change this so that it fits and it, it's more relative because when you're packaging, this might not exactly work. However, I am going to go over that specifically in a video on packaging. So don't worry too much. I'm going to show you how to do that sort of thing there. But if you're familiar with that, keep an eye out. And if you're not, just be aware that if your videos aren't working in a package build for any reason, this could be why. It could also be fine. It really does depend on some packaging settings and where you're packaging it from. So don't worry too much. I just want to bring that to your attention. If you're seeing issues with your, your command list widget in the uh, package build, that could be why. All right, so this is good for update video. And so now we want to make sure we also call update video right in the same chain of logic. This way, the description and the video are updated immediately upon the widgets opening with the default value. Now, that's all well and good. And if we do this, this will work. But we're not quite done yet, because if we just do this, then it's only it's still only going to be one value. We need to change it every time we move as well. So we have two events in here, move up and move down, that we set up in the previous episodes. And it did all this logic. But we have to make sure that we're also calling update description, update video in each of these paths. Now, since these nodes are pretty much all the exact same uh, after the first, after the initial check here, you could bring this into one path. So after the, the set current index, you could meet up here if you wanted And that would be pretty clean. So you can do that. And that's probably how I'll keep it, because I think it looks nicer. But regardless, move up, move down. These were the same in all of them, and we already had these in the previous episodes as well. So nothing has changed here for all this logic. The only thing we did is we added two additional nodes here. Update description, update video. So we're just calling our two new functions that we made at the end of this. So every time we move up and down, we make sure to update the description and the video. Now, an important point with that, so if we are to go to our command list, you might be wondering if you go down to the bottom, or oh, I don't have a video at the bottom, but if you press down when you're at the bottom or if you press up when you're at the top, does it reset your, your file or your description? No, it doesn't, because we do check and make sure we're within the bounds before we allow that movement. If you have it where it starts back up to the top, if you go down to the bottom and press down again, it still will not cause any issues because then you'll just load the top one. So you really can't run into any pitfalls with that here, not with the, the methods that I've shown. All right, and now that is done and we are good. Our command list is looking good, but we can still make our game better and easier to use as well. So there's a few things I want to change. This first one's really minor, but it's been bugging me for a bit and we should definitely change it. So if we go into our fighter template character.h code class, we're going to the code now. I want to scroll down to my F command function here, F command. So there are three variables here that were in 64s in the previous episode and, and every episode since they've been added, really. So we have max frames between inputs, max frames can be held, and current frames held. And they were integer 64s. Now, they were integer 64s because frames, when you're tracking frame count, are stored as int 64 because of how fast they can build. If you have the, the game or the engine open and, you, and you're reading the frame count, it can get really big really fast when you're thinking 60 frames every second. Say you have the game open for four hours. Well, there's a lot of frames that have been 
added and, and gone through at that time. However, really, I did not need to make these integer 64s because think of what these values represent. First of all, max frames between inputs is the maximum number of frames we allow between inputs within this command. Meaning if we press, uh, say the input is light attack and medium attack, that's how you perform the command. If I say that they are pressed, they can be pressed up to 20 frames apart. That means if I press light, then medium within 20 frames, I'll still trigger the command. Well, <laughs> int 64 is significantly bigger than integer. All right. And so we, we are never going to be going to these values, at least I hope not, where you're allowing commands to fire like millions, billions, however many it, it may be. It's more than that. But the uh, you're not going to be allowing these commands so many frames apart. And so just make an integer. It's way smaller and every command will take up less space then. It's way better to do it that way. Same with the maximum frames can be held. Again, you might have, like, maybe you can even hold it 300 frames, like, but you're not going to be, you're not reaching these really, really huge values. Even if you could hold it 20,000 frames, like, it's not a problem with a regular integer. We don't need an N64 for that. Lastly, current frames held. I mean, technically, I guess the player could be holding <laughs> the input for that long, and they could reach that value, and if it does reach that value and you're worried that it's going to crash, you could just stop them. You could force them to not be able to hold the value anymore as you're approaching it. You could have a maximum. So if they really want to hold a button for like several days in practice mode or something, you could still just cap it. So really, I don't think any of these should be in 64s. That makes them significantly smaller if they're not. And it doesn't change anything with the code. We don't have to change a single thing in here. Everything stays exactly the same, but it just makes it a lot smaller and we have a lot of commands. So we have to make sure we're being as efficient as possible. So I recommend making that change. And then once we make that change, uh, you might have to go into your structure as well, your F command detail structure that I was showing you earlier. And I believe I had made these integers and not integer 64s. But if you did, I'd recommend just converting them to integer now you don't need integer 64 your mutant command data should stay the same i changed mine and i did not have to rewrite these these all retained because of course an integer can fit within an int 64 so it's not like causing a casting issue or anything like that anyway that's something minor but it is important for performance especially as we get more and more commands so there's no reason to have all that extra data when we don't need it the other thing I want to do was what I mentioned at the start of the episode, which is where we go through and we get rid of the, the dependency to have the command list on the character blueprint, but then also in the data table. Just in the data table is good, and grabbing data from the data table is really quick, really efficient. So it makes our lives easier, and it's still very efficient. So for this, we're going to want to go to our base character BP. So this is not the mutant, this is the base character. This is what all my characters inherit from. My mutant is here, right? But the base character is just this, just this base class that we're grabbing, or that we're performing logic in. All right, so we're going to our base character BP. And the base character does not have any commands set up by default. You'll see no commands on here because, like I said, they just don't have any. This is the base character. You're never in never going to be playing as the base character you'll be playing as a child of it so you don't have to change anything in here we're just going to add a new function and then we're going to call this function when we want to in the other characters so i did it in the in the blueprint you could do it in the code as well either way i'm doing the blueprint because i can directly access the data table from here but it doesn't matter either way so we want to add a custom event just like this and I went ahead and called it update character commands. Now, an event is much like a function, so we can go ahead and add an input parameter after you compiled. Make sure you compile after you make the event. And we can actually add a data table reference that we're going to pass. You could also do another file path and load it that way, either way. But we, I'm just passing a data table here, and we're gonna use this data table to grab all the rows, do all that good stuff, and then add the commands from the data table to the actual character array. The reason I'm passing a data table is because this is the base character. So we want to be able to use this on any character. 
Right now I only have the mutant, so like when I'm grabbing the data table, whatever, I'm using the mutant one. But we want to think ahead and make sure we make this as uh, flexible as possible. So anyway, like I said, when we get this up here, you want to add an input parameter, and I called it data table to reference. And the way you find this is very simple. You just type in data table, and you're going to want the object reference. Once you have this, you can drag off of it and do something like get data table row names, which will allow us to get all, all the row names for this data table. In this case, it's all of our commands. Then we're going to drag off the return and we're going to loop through them. For every command that we have, we want to grab the data from it. However, I'm actually going to clean this up and make this better. I should have done this before, so this is my fault. The data table that we reference should go directly into this node right here. So I'm going to clean this up a second. Here we go. All right. So now if we drag off the data table to reference, we can also get data table row. Okay, we can get the individual row. This gets all the row names, but then we can grab the data from the specific row. If we take the array element off the for each loop and pass that into the row name on this function, then it's going to return the data for that row, right? We've done this plenty of times before, so you've seen this before. The out row now can be broken to grab the details of that row. So if we break it, you get F command details. You can click the down arrow, open everything up here. And that's what I've done right here. Okay, so let me zoom this out so it looks a little bit better. There we go. So we have this here, and this has all the data that we need to pass along to the commands. All right, now understand that this data table has more data than the command structure. For example, the description, the video path, and the character class are not on the command structure. Okay, they're not in here. And likewise, the command structure has some things that aren't in the data table, like the information about the command and how the player or character is currently using it. So it's okay that they don't line up because we're just going to pass the data we want to pass. And you can actually hide the other nodes. I'll talk about that in a second. But if you break the F command details and then you have all your options here, we can actually make a new command by literally typing make and then the name of the structure minus command. And in my class defaults, my character commands, it is an array of commands, right? Just to show you. Character commands is an array of F command. So that's what we're doing here. We can make an instance of this structure. Make command. You got to find the one that is the right one. And then you can pull this down, hit, click that arrow, and get all the default values. From here, it's pretty simple because I did that and I just transferred over everything that I wanted. The name, the input types, the required state, resulting state, required meter, max frames between inputs, max frames can be held. Now, for these other nodes that aren't filled out, you can actually ignore them and hide them if you want. So you can click on the break node and go over to the details, pin options, and select the things and disable the ones that you don't want. Okay, so I know I'm not going to be using them, so I get rid of them. And now this node is smaller, and we don't have to look at that ugly data. Likewise. We can do it here on the making a command. So we know we're not going to set the current frames held is charging or has used command because those are things triggered on the command by the character or really by the player when they perform these inputs. So we can actually get rid of these three values at the bottom here. And now we only are transferring the data that we want to transfer. Now, once we make this command great, we need to add it to the character command list. There's two ways we can do this. We can use add or add unique. So add unique will allow you to add it, and it will only allow one of the same exact structure to this array. Now that's good. But the problem with that is if you have not deleted your commands that are currently in the mutants BP, then for example, see how I have 22 commands in the mutant from light attack all the way down to X light attack. Well, when I'm trying to test this out, assuming they're all the same, you're not going to get anything here. So you won't really know if it worked. So as a test, what I did is I made sure that I added them instead of adding unique. So the way I did this is literally character commands, get your array here, uh, drag off of it and type add. 
and then just drag in the command result uh, return from the make command node. All right, that's what I did for this right here. That's what that looks like. So just make sure you plug in the execution line. And now when you play your game, you have to make sure that the mutant is spawned because of the nature of how this works. So we need to have the mutant in here, but you can pause the game immediately after that. And you wanna find your mutant in the world outliner. Then when you go down, you can look at their character commands, right? You see they have 46 elements because I have 23 initially, uh, zero to 22 are the, are the indices. So 23 elements, last one being the X-Light attack. And we just added a bunch of new ones. So when I look at them, you can see 23 is the light attack again. And if I look at, say, X-Light attack, here you go. Uh, let's see which one has like a, a resulting input. Is that, here we go. So si if I go to 16, I should have backward jumping as the required state. So I go to index 16 and I have backward jumping. So now I need to go to the same counterpart. So 16 after they start up again, okay? So 23, so what's that, 39? And required stays backward jumping. So you can actually look at this and you can make sure all your, your data is correct, right? All your data is how you expect, that way you know everything's functioning properly. And then once you're happy with it, you can take away the add if you want and change it to add unique, but it's not really going to matter because actually we're not going to be adding them. Uh, we're not going to be adding them on top of the others when we get rid of them. It's they, all the commands should be unique. So you, you shouldn't have two of the same command, even if they're the same inputs, whatever, they shouldn't be the exact same command unless it'll add anyway. So I'd recommend just doing add or add unique, whatever you feel better with. It doesn't really matter. My point of that is make sure that you're happy with what you see, that you see it populating properly. When you are happy with it, we need to go into the children classes. So in this case, I'm specifically going to my mutant BP, going into my event graph. I have begin play, which is calling parent begin play. That's how we set it up. Well, after begin play runs for both this and the parent, I wanted to go ahead and call update character commands, passing in the specific data table to reference for this character. There's a ton of ways you can do this. This is just how I decided to do it because it's super easy. But for each character you're on, if you do this small one node thing, you can pass in a different data table for each and then the Vanguard could have their own, the mutant can have their own and they can all get their proper commands. So since the mutant BP is a child of base character BP, I can just call this function or really this event. So I just update character commands. We don't wanna add an event, we could, Okay, that would be if we want to override it, like have our own logic in here, but we don't need that. We just need to call the one that is on the base character. So I can do update character commands and we can just call function right here. And then you pass it the data table you want. I chose mutant command data because that's my data table for my commands. Now, when you're good and happy with it, you can go into your class defaults and you can actually clear the character commands array. I know it's scary, Okay, it is scary. So you can make a backup before you do this if you want. But your character commands can now be zero. Now, when you come into the game though, don't worry. If it was broken, I wouldn't be able to perform any of my commands. But if it works, I'll be able to play as normal. And we can even test it with the world outliner again. But before we even do the world outliner, let's just see if we can do it. So I can attack. I can use my special moves. Okay, so everything's working as intended. You don't have to actually worry about this. This is working as we would expect it to. Now, if we do go ahead and let's say we pause it, let's go down to our mutant. Here we go, and let's look at the command. And you see that they have 23 elements, which is how many we should have. The last one should be the X light attack, which it is. And the first one should be the light attack. There you go. You can see we have successfully removed the dependency of having a command, the character commands in the mutant BP as well as the data table. So you can just use this data table now. You can use this for everything. So you can fill out everything and we will grab all the data from it. 
All right, guys, but that's all I got for you today. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please subscribe. It does more for myself and the channel than anything else you can do, and I just really appreciate it. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube membership, Patreon members and supporters. Thank you guys for everything you've done for all the love and support. I am so incredibly grateful and I really, really, I'm just so happy that you guys are as excited as I am about this project and about this tutorial series and everything, working on your own games. It's wonderful, wonderful seeing it. If you did have any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. There's a link in the description. I'd be happy to help you out. It's completely free. We'll get you sorted so you can keep working on the tutorials and, and keep making your awesome game. Anyway, guys, like I said, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.